Um, we have two New York City ambassadors this year. I'm really excited about that. I was able to go last year. Um, Meg and Susan were the ambassadors. Thank you, thank you for a great walk in 2021, Meg and, and Susan. And this year it's going to be Derek and Carolyn. So, um, okay, let's see if I can invite Carolyn back in. And um, so Central Park is a really big walk. Um, okay. Hi there. Awesome. You're back. You're back. Yeah. So this is my first time being an ambassador. So I'm really excited. Um, I guess I'll let you talk. Was, I'm just how did you, well, how did you learn? I would love to know, because I, I was telling them um, in the break that, that I had walked last year in Central Park, and I, that's where I met Derek, um, which was really a great experience to, to walk with a male breast cancer survivor. So he's missing a breast as well. And he, mm -hmm. there's an interview with him where he talks about his grief that he went through. And so um, how did you learn about Stand Tall and come to us? I'm so glad. I know you came to one of the first ambassador Zoom info meetings that we had. And I would love to hear how you found out about us and how you decided to be an ambassador. Um, I think I learned about you through, I'm in like three different um, survivor and survivor Facebook groups. So you came up in one of them, um, maybe Flat and Fabulous, or um, I'm not quite sure which group, but- uh, So one of the Facebook flat I, groups? Yeah, it was one of the Facebook um, threads, basically. So that's how I discovered you. And then I felt like it was a sign because I've been wanting to get involved. And I, I'm an activist in other areas of my life, but this is extremely close to home, obviously. So it appealed to me on that level. Right. I, I feel like one of the things we tried to do is make the campaign really accessible to people so they could either go into their that where they live or someplace nearby drive to it um, because, you know, uh, advocacy starts local. Right. And when you can make it local and specific and then grow out from there, it's really powerful. So exactly. And also just yeah. to connect with people in real life. We've all been isolated for two years and everything's been online. So to actually meet up in person is pretty thrilling. Yeah. It really was. I know last year going at traveling was one of the first times I traveled to go to some of the stand tall events. So, and just to kind of, I mean, to me, it's a, you know, it's a unique path that we chose. I, I shouldn't say unique. I mean, about 50% of women go flat. You don't see them. A lot of them are wearing breast forms. Um, it's a lot of older women, but in this movement, there's a lot of young women. And I think you mentioned that you're a pre -viver. I am could a pre-viver. Yes. Could you tell us about that? Like I, the research um, that you may have done to go flat and Sure. Um, originally, uh, when my oncologist first found lumps in my breasts, um, I was advised to just get a lumpectomy. But this was before the pandemic. So, you know, like many people, a lot of appointments were put off because it wasn't safe to go to the doctor, be in the hospital, whatever. So by the time I finally met with a breast surgeon, that's when I learned I was high risk. And it was going to be a much more complicated surgery than just a lumpectomy. And I had considered reconstruction, but um, I really wanted to be natural looking. You know, for most of my life, I was pretty small busted and almost flat anyway. And I never felt comfortable being um, large breasted as I got older. I always felt kind of awkward. Um, and I didn't, I, I never really articulated that until I met with my surgeon. So all this knowledge came all at once. Um, once she kind of explained what my options were and then talked about reconstruction, I just kind of naively said, well, how small can I be? And she said, you can be flat. And a light bulb went off like, oh, that's an option. Like, that's something I can do. So um, she sent me to a plastic surgeon that she works very closely with, who also works with uh, different trans and non-binary people. So his surgical skills, he was really focused in that area. And... I knew immediately as soon as I spoke with him that that's the surgery I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really hard to, I didn't have the language to articulate that, um, why it felt natural or why it didn't seem strange until a really good friend of mine recommended that I find a support group. So that kind of helped me get ready for um, just how to prepare for my decision. But real talk, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and this is something, I, I don't remember who you just interviewed, but it's, it's a really exciting time to make these choices because there is so much body positivity and acceptance. I've literally 
I don't feel so different in my new body, even though it is very different. Like I walk outside, no one looks twice. I don't feel that would be the case 10 years ago. So that's something I'm hyper aware of. And it just feels really cool to have a community platform to talk about it. I think it's a hard thing to explain to people who haven't really gone through it. Like, why would you do that? Why would you make that choice? So that's why I want to get involved. Right. I agree with you completely. I feel like it's a very, like we fit in this, this big kind of global movement of body positivity and it feels very exciting. It makes me connected to people who have been marginalized, um, people mm -hmm. who have been looked at differently and people wanting them to like, kind of like step up and look like you're supposed to. And, and right. um, it feels like it, it feels really positive to be aligned with those people. And um, I, I love that your, your surgeon said, well, you know, told you, well, you can go, you know, how small can I go? Well, you can go flat. I mean, that's, yeah. that's great. Like that's as My small as you want to go, me. you know, like, yeah, I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> and then, yeah. Like, hey, and, and, you know, I, I, yeah. And people not people with that aren't in the breast cancer community that haven't been diagnosed or aren't in this world don't realize that they kind of think, well, of course, you know, you can do that. It's like, no, it's not presented that way. It's kind of it it used to be and i think and it was for me in 2016 that i i asked to like have no reconstruction i didn't know what that really meant what does it mean and there was no one talked to me about what it would look like where my right. scars would be nothing like that and then they did say but your implants are easy peasy i'm like i don't know i have an autoimmune disease i'm not sure it's right for me yes it's totally right for you and if you don't like them we can take it out easy peasy and it you know cut to two years of just disaster um for me i know other people have a different experience with implants but this this term aesthetic flat closure is so important because it gives us language it gives the surgeon language yes. it gives the patient language the whole the medical providers ship it gives everybody language that we know exactly what it means smooth flat chest wall i don't want to be i don't want extra skin and so it's um it's really important and it gives us the because my husband's going. Um, oh. <laughs> but it, you know, it, it can be undervalued, like the importance of that language. And um, and your surgeon fortunately kind of gave it to you without that term, but gave you the, the language. So, yeah, yeah, I never thought about it. Um, I literally went in there expecting to come out with a whole different plan of action. So I kind of felt relieved, to be honest. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of the women and people in our group um, also express, you know, the one and done attitude is I don't want to fear, oh, am I going to get more lumps or do I need to fear that it's going to reoccur? Like all of that was erased and not to say I won't still be getting checked and, and, all, and monitoring my health, but it's a big relief. Um, right. And then my other motivation, um, <laughs> this is the nerd side of me is like, you know, when they start, when I started to do the research about what reconstruction looks like and how it affects your muscles and your body and your strength and how long you're going to be in surgery, all I could think is, when am I going to be able to play guitar again? Mm -hmm. Which is so insane, but it's like, it's a big part no. of my life and it's something that gives me joy. And I literally said to my surgeon, like, um, how long am I going to be um, in physical therapy? How much mobility am I going to lose? Because this is, I'll be depressed. You know, like, yeah. I don't care yeah. that much about having, you know, I don't feel like my breasts are my sexuality or they don't make me feel any less feminine. And that's a huge thing. I know a lot of people struggle with it. I feel very blessed that that's not me. But, um, you know, I just think about like, well, this is a new lease on life and playing guitar is a big part of my life. So when can I play again? <laughs> so I even like bought you know like my guitars on the wall but I bought a stand on the ground because they're like you're not going to be able to raise your arms and reach I was like I need to make it reachable so that every day I can walk into my studio and look at my guitar and know that I'm healing and I'll be playing again soon and that literally like got mm. me through everything mm. and I remember like texting my surgeon taking photos like hey I just want to let you know I can move my arm this way and such and such can I play again he's like yeah okay you can play again just carry anything heavy so that really you know it's like it's funny to talk about it but that's that's really what my motivation was to um look i i think it's look, it better i think it's myself, so profound you know? to talk about yeah i i don't think it's small i think i think for you to talk about being able to do an activity that gives you joy is mm -hmm. far to have far more gravity and weight than how you look in a bathing suit, which is yeah. kind of what women, you know, that you, they go in like, well, you're not gonna look right in a bathing suit, but, but you're saying, but can I play the guitar, which I love and gives me joy? 
Could I, right. I mean, I, I can't swim anymore in the ocean. I have lost range of motion in my right arm because of my um, under the muscle implant mm. um, reconstruction. And mm. it did a lot of damage and my pec tore off my yeah. sternum. Um, I had no idea that was a possibility. And as rare right. as it is, it happens to people. I know a lot of people that have connected with me over that. And uh, that was a huge sacrifice to make for something that I wound up not enjoying anyway. And it didn't um, cause me a lot of complications health-wise. So yeah. I think saying, you know, I'm a massage therapist and I need to go back to work as soon as possible. I have young kids. I want to be able to pick them up. I have, right. you know, when you, when you disrupt muscles, you disrupt function. And yeah. no one knows for sure when you get that function back and how much of it you get back. So I think that's to be able to play a guitar to heal through that is yeah. powerful. I mean, yeah. I'm still, my, my surgery was a year ago in March and I still don't have full mobility in my left arm back. But um, one day I had a show and I was dancing with the bass on my shoulder. And I think I swung my arm like, I could feel the cramp going across my back. And I'm like, oh no, this is the top of the song. I gotta get through this. But <laughs> I feel like it made me stronger. Even though I was like, oh yeah, I should have stretched a bit more. Like I keep forgetting I'm not totally healed yet. Like it takes a long time. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, I had lymph nodes um, removed on my left side. I, I still get um, little shivers and zaps and and, yeah. and weird stuff that goes with my hands. So, um, and I know a lot of people have lymphedema. So it's um, everybody heals differently. What you know, one mm -hmm. thing you were talking about, we were talking about how we look, and you were talking about transgender surgeons. Um, yeah, I actually asked for my. I wanted my scars to look like, and this is when I went flat. I had implants first, but when I went flat. I asked my surgeon, my different surgeon who gave me flat, um, if I could have um, the kind of top surgery, the female to male surgery scars. And I, I and, and, and so this is an incision pattern guide that mm -hmm. not putting on a shirt, Kim Bowles um, created. It's also on the brochures, but it just gives, I think it really lays it out there how much people want to be, want to say in what they look like. You know, right. I want, I know we can't, we can't like say this is exactly how, because anatomy is different on everybody, but we right. really care what those scars look like and what our chest looks like. So you, I don't know, you brought up um, some important points about that. Yeah. Can you yeah, tell us it's... where, um, oh, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make sure where. people know like where your walk is, how they can find you. I know you're going to be walking with Derek, but anybody else that might be walking with you, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. I don't know who else is on our team yet because um, I'm just starting to communicate with everyone, um, but we will be walking in Central Park on Sunday, October 16th. And I've invited to just on social media today, because it's my first time really publicly talking about it, even though I've dropped hints in my Instagram here and there. Um, but I invited my friends to walk. And I kind of said, you know, you don't need to be flat. This is to show support in us representing the visibility. So I'm hoping after I speak with Derek, he's so enthusiastic. Like I just watched your interview with him today. Um, I have a feeling he's going to be really good at giving me some mentorship to rally up a team. Yeah, and I think a lot of the ladies who walked last year in New York um, have shared his video, and hopefully they'll come out and support as well. Um, mm -hmm. We certainly will help that too. I mean, all a team just takes one person, so it doesn't matter yeah. the number. It's just about the just, but that that having that support from friends and family is is really important. I also want to make people know that. Um, there's no need to donate if you don't want to. Um, this is a visibility campaign and a lot of breast cancer patients experience financial toxicity and they should not be, you know, they're not required to give any money. You'll be asked to on most of the platforms and it's up to you if you would like to or not. So um, get out there and walk in Central Park um, with Carolyn and Derek if you're in New York City in October on the 16th. I think we may have lost you. I, I see spinning. So... I'm gonna wait just a second and see if we have our back to say bye. But if not, um, that is a really big walk there in Central Park. I think there were uh, there were at least 40 people last year. Oh, it, it dropped her. So anyway, but I think she told you where to find her. I'll put it in the comments as well. Thank you guys. Uh, I think we're back tomorrow with another two or three ambassadors to interview. So um, join a team if you wanna be flat visible. Join a team if you wanna support aesthetic flat closure and body positivity. All right. Bye.